What's up, everyone? I'm Chris Hazel, and you're listening to Orchestrated, a music podcast. I hope you guys had a really good holiday season. I know I did. You know, my um, my fairly young family uh, decided to do Christmas at home for the very first time. Normally, we would go out to California and visit parents and grandparents and do the family thing, but this year, you know, we decided to stay put and put up a Christmas tree and decorate and do Christmas morning. And it was like the first time that we ever did that in this house since we moved in a couple years ago. So it was, it was very cool. Um, but I want to ask, you know, as the decorations are starting to come down and you're hearing less and less jingle bells in the grocery stores, are there any fond memories that you're walking away from 2023 with? You know, anything that you're proud of? You know, and as we start to turn our gaze to the new year, like, is there anything that you're really looking forward to? Maybe you have some goals that you'd like to achieve or some experiences that you'd like to have. You know, maybe there's a, a creative project that you're really looking forward to hopping into. And I, and I just want to say, like, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're looking forward to, I hope that you go into 2024 feeling motivated and inspired. I'll tell you, here at Cine Samples, we have some big things that we're pretty excited about coming up next year. 2023 was mostly dedicated to getting Museo built, fine-tuning the experience so that it's the best that it can be, and packing it full of really good instruments and tools to, to help foster creativity and musical exploration. And now that we've gotten it to a place where we feel really good about it and we're super excited to be sharing it with all of you, we are expanding our view to include building an online presence that aims to do the same thing. So next year, in addition to Museo continuing to grow, you can also look forward to more interviews and videos and podcast episodes that explore, you know, kind of just what it means exactly to be a musician in today's modern era. Because at the end of the day, our core aim here at Cine Samples is to support music creators like you and to inspire you and empower you and hopefully add value to your own musical journey. So with all of that said, as we're getting those things planned and organized, I thought I'd go back through the Cine Samples archive and see if there was anything worth posting to keep you inspired while we kind of get our ducks in a row for 2024. And in doing so, I came across this brilliant interview from a few years ago with the American composer David Newman. Now, throughout his career, David has scored literally over a hundred films. He made a name for himself back in the 80s with movies like Throw Mama from the Train, Heathers, and then later on, some of my personal favorites, you know, The Sandlot, Tommy Boy, Death to Smoochie. I mean, the list goes on. Like I said, it's, it's over a hundred films. He also happens to be the son of one of the most influential figures in film music history, Alfred Newman. So naturally, you know, with those two experiences combined, he's just full of a lot of historical knowledge. And he has some really keen observations of like, you know, the nuances of that history. In the interview, our CEO Mike Patty sits down with David and they talk about his career, what it was like to get started back then, how music transformed filmmaking in the 1930s, and even a little bit about how technology has transformed music today. So needless to say, you're in for a treat. I know I was when I was listening to it. Anyway, I'm going to stop flapping my gums now, and I'll just say I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. So without further delay, here's Mike Patty's conversation with David Newman. Thanks for being here with oh, us. Oh, it's great. This is I love talking about this stuff. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's just wildly interesting how this all developed and... The Fox stage is part of the development of film music from the, you know, from the 30s when there was actually, you could put, mute, you know, sound on films. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a, an amazing history. So as we'll, I'm assuming, get into it. Yeah. Bit, so yeah. let's talk a little bit about uh, yourself, first of all. Sure. Uh, you started off uh, in the business playing violin. violin. Yeah. I, yeah. I was a, I was a, I went to USC as a, what we call a violin major. So I got an undergrad degree and I actually started as a piano major, but I ended up as a violin because um, I was both piano and violin. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I got a master's in conducting at USC in the late 70s. But during that time, uh, I was, you know, we had our little group of friends and we sort of infiltrated and there was so much work in Los Angeles in the late 70s. I graduated in 76, 1976. 
And so we, a lot of us that worked, uh, the friends and everything, we started working in television, film, record dates, jingles, you know, there was probably enough work for five or 600 musicians to make a full-time living in Los Angeles at that time. Very different now, but wow. at, that, at that time, everything in television was live. There was tons of record dates going on, tons of jingles, uh, you know, jingles or commercials. Um, uh, you know, so it was it was a blast. You know, mm. I, I had no intention of writing any music. Um, I wanted to be a conductor, and I was studying conducting, working, getting a master's degree in conducting at USC. And I had a private teacher that I spent hours and hours with um, studying conducting, and then. I just it just never happened, and I kind of gave up. And then I decided that I'd try for film music, and um, I had to teach myself to compose to a degree. I mean, I think everyone that's trained in music um, in a conservatory knows how to write. I mean, you know, you have to write uh, expositions of fugues and and do dictation. So you, I mean, I could yeah. hum something, play something, and write it down, of course. But to really learn, and then learning orchestration was just. Uh, it was yeah. just terribly difficult. To so, so as a violinist in this l the late 70s and, and, and 80s, yeah. what were some of the projects you got to work yeah, on? Yeah, I time? worked a lot for Goldsmith and for uh, John Williams. I worked on E.T. I worked on the first Star Trek movie, which was at Fox. Uh, uh, E.T. was at MGM, but uh, 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 Jerry, the, the, I mean, Star Trek was a Paramount film. Paramount has a stage, but Jerry loved the, everybody Jer loved the, Jerry, Jerry Goldsmith. Jerry Goldsmith, yeah. That loved the Fox stage. And, and Lionel did a lot of conducting there, too. Lionel Newman, who was my dad's brother, who was the, uh, you know, head of music for a year, probably even longer than my dad in the 70s and 80s. Um, and we, uh, I, so I played, I, I remember that, we played, for a whole week, and they, th you know, basically we recorded about 15 minutes of music in a in a week, four days or so. Wow! And they Why? just got Why? all thrown out because yeah. Robert Weiss didn't like the music. Jerry Goldsmith is the modernist hegemonic figure of the late 19th century, right? John Williams is kind of the populist. He he's a, he's a he's brought up as a pianist and in big band. They're, they all know. They're all completely trained in classical. I'm not saying that. It's just Jerry was doing modern composition. John was doing big dance stuff, and they and they all, they became film composers. So they sort of moved, you right. know, into this kind of culture of of film music. So Jerry was still in the like Papillon, Patton, uh, Planet of the Apes era, which are all kind of modernist scores. Mm. So the original score for Star Trek was kind of like Debussy, like La Mer. It's like a big ship, you know, in the in the night, and they just it. Star Wars had come out, and it they just weren't having it. They wanted a big theme and everything, and they right. just argued and argued and argued. And there are lots of stories, some of them quite funny and weird, and you know, it got pretty crazy that week. So we all went away, and then a month later came back, and then of course that da 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 da. -da he wrote that, which is. A triumphant kind of theme for Star Trek, but it wasn't. It wasn't where they started on the on the on the movie. So that was all. That was all at uh, at Fox. You know? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. So you did violin, and then so what? What did the transition to being a violinist to being a uh, composer? Well, how by, did, how, by yeah. the time I was in my twenties, I wasn't. I wasn't really. I didn't want to do violin as a career. I was doing it to make money, and I mean, I loved playing the violin. Actually, once I didn't care that much about it, I got I really improved. It, it, it's um, it's a weird thing, but anyway, I wanted to be a conductor, and I was obsessed with it. But it really wasn't constitutionally compatible for me. I didn't like traveling. Uh, it was very difficult to get into. You needed to mentor with somebody I, either in Europe or at Juilliard. You know, various yeah. things. It just, I was more interested in the, we used to have the, these platonic discussions about what is conducting. It fundamentally, like Plato would ask, what is justice? Or, you know, what is beauty, right? Why is a Beethoven symphony beautiful? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you, so what is the essence of conducting? It's a nonverbal, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we went into this, the weeds with this guy who I 
found just by luck. His name was William Kettering. A lot of film composers studied with him. My brother Tom did, Randy did, and a lot of, he did a lot of ear training for film composers too and counterpoint and, you know, it, kind of that kind of thing. And then I just, I just, it just was not gonna ha I just, I got married. I needed, I didn't want to be a violinist the rest of my life. And um, so I just decided. Nobody asked me to do it. Yeah. And I made a demo and I worked, I, I started off working with another composer because I just wasn't, you know, and I, you'd think I'd know how to orchestrate, but I didn't. I I'd mm. played in orchestras all my life. It just, it's a whole different process learning how to, how to orchestrate, you know, even though I knew all this, this music, it just, it, it didn't click for me. But eventually it clicked. So by the, like, say, I'd say from about 81, so I worked 76 to about 82 in the studios, and then from about 82 to 85, 86, it took me to get a job. I did a couple of like industrial films and, and stuff, and then I got a, and then I got a, then I got a show. I, I got a Roger Corman film, and then I got a, this film called Critters, and then DeVito hired me to do Throw Mama from the Train, which I think was 87, and then I was off to the races. You know, nice. once, yeah. once you did a film in that era, there just weren't that many people that could say they had done a, a, a studio film. So it, it was much easier to make a career when I started than it is now, where mm -hmm. it's virtually, um, I mean, it's very difficult to make a career now. So, so maybe that's a good segue. Yeah. So what does it look like today as a composer, uh, you know, oh, uh, compared to? Yeah, as a young the, person, the, I don't know. I mean, I think there's just so many more people that can do it. For, there wasn't any technology. or. Okay, so 86, there is very rudimentary technology to do mock-ups. So that, that's Elfman starting then, right? Right, right. And they're doing mock-ups, but they really don't sound very good. Um, yeah. Like, I remember a story of Elfman when he did Batman, which was a big film that for John Peters and crazy people at, um, is Batman? It's Warner Brothers, right? Yeah. Batman, yeah. So he did a mock-up of Star Wars, of the star. So he played them the Star Wars Q, right? The John Williams Q, and then he played him a mock-up of the Star Wars Q, and he says, look, this is this is the difference, mm. but this is what you're gonna hear on Batman, but see, this is where it's gonna get, you know? So, oh, so, as he, a way, so he educated he them. He tried they, yeah. to educate them <clears throat> as much as you can educate somebody, like because it was really very rudimentary. So I didn't start mocking up anything till late 80s. So I was mm. doing, I was just orchestra, I, I didn't use an orchestrator, I just, I had score paper on my piano and terrible handwriting. And then my first foray into technology was with music engraving. I found a company, because I used to, I, I ran the composers program at Sundance from I think 87 to 90 or something. And there was an outfit there, um, it was called a Rotto Music Manuscript, or they're now out of business, but it was a PC-based, yeah, tablet-based thing. And I started using that. Because um, it really cut down on my error, you know, copying errors and stuff. Right. Yeah. And then eventually I started little by little mocking things up. And, and working in a sequencer. Yeah, yeah. I, I started in um, uh, some PC-based sequencer. I forget what it was called. And then I used Vision, you know, opcode, which yeah. it doesn't exist anymore, which had some really nice stuff that I wish Logic and Cubase had, but they don't. Like you could have, you could st you could stack like 32 sequences and then put them, you could do like little pieces of stuff and then paste it all together and, you know. Yeah. But it, it wouldn't work now because you have to, you have to print everything now, you know. But, um, you know, and then eventually technology. So with technology, it completely opens up the, um, the thing, so, yeah. and there are all these music schools. Um, I have my I, pros and cons about that, about paying all that money for a degree in film composition when it's going to be so hard to get the money back that you might have borrowed to go to school. Um, I mean, I, at least it's not yeah. four years, it's not like going to law school or, or med school, but it's still, I don't know that they really help you get a job or really are honestly explaining to you how weird this is, you know? Um, I think that the best way to learn is to like assist another composer, right? Yeah, and, but and, then but and then, then you get stuck Actually in just it. doing it is... Yeah, I, I don't know. There are pros and cons of that too. You know, you might not be, I could never have worked for another composer. It just, I wasn't constitutionally able yeah. to do it. It's hard enough for me to work with an orchestrator uh, I've hardly ever had anyone 
ghostwrite or 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 assist me writing on a on a series. I, you know, and and I've seen people get stuck in um, mentor intern relationships, and um, so I don't know. You know, I I the only advice I can give a young person would be to be have a well rounded education because mm -hmm. I know and try to get your music to editors, not music editors, not directors, but editors yeah. because they right. cut in music. They don't care where it came from. They'll cut in music while they're um, filming. Mm. And if you can get your music to an editor, that's you have a much better chance of, of, of somebody listening to it and, and seeing you know what it is. And then the other thing is have a well-rounded education. You know, be well-read, be no theater, no music, you opera. You never know what a director is going to be interested yeah. in talking about. You want to be an interesting person to talk to, you know. So it sounds like it's almost like you want to have the foundational musical stuff established. But, and the technology is something that is just a tool that you use. Yeah, but, say, but, but yeah, but a lot of people no, there are a lot of people now that, you know, are some of our biggest composers are don't read and write music. The Beatles didn't read or write music. They celebrated not reading right. or writing yeah. music. It, it, the, again, I'm constitutionally unable to even, I, I, I do not judge it. I just cannot imagine making music without being trained. Mm -hmm. I don't think training does anything in terms of how good you are as a composer, because I think com yeah. composition is a procedure of choices. You know, you, you, you do something and you retro, you, you, think on it and retrospectively you edit it and you, you know, right. it, and it, I don't, I don't think that has anything to do with training. It, it, it just, I would think it would be terrifying to be a musician and not be really well trained, but, right. Right, right. but there's a lot of that now it, it, because the technology is so good. You know, I mean, I basically orchestrate everything in logic now, you know, and, and because it's pretty damn good logic at, 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 uh, at transcribing because you can, um, you can, uh, uh, there are a lot of things you can do with notate because it comes from a uh, notator. It, it, it has a little bit of a DNA of uh, notator. And then what was it after notator? It was, um, but they're, they oh, have- E-Magic. Yeah, uh, E-Magic. Yeah. That's what it was. And they have a, they have a DNA of, of, of that. They, they don't allow you to, to quantize the duration, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, you can make it look right, quantized, in the notation without quantizing the music, because as you know, with samples, quantizing samples sometimes just doesn't doesn't right, right. doesn't work. You know. So obviously, technology has changed, yeah. right? I mean, we can talk for hours yeah, about yeah, yeah, the yeah. stuff everyone kind of already knows. Well, yeah. But what are the similarities between the like the craft of film music? In my opinion, is this it's really been the same? Would you say? Are yeah. there any similarities between it was and you know in the seventies and eighties? as there are in scoring pictures I, today. I mean, you can look at epochs or stages of film music, you know, from 1930. I'm fascinated now by the early 30s because the there wasn't any film music till really till 1930, 31, and they struggled for years to try to figure out what it was. Hmm. My dad was a large part of that. He was here in 1930, Max Steiner was here, Franz Waxman was here in 1934, Korngold came from Vienna. Um, you can't, I cannot express how famous George Korngold was. And I mean, not George, uh, Eric Korngold was um, in the 30s. He was, he was as famous a musician as there was in the world uh, at, that, at that time. And he came to do uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and th that all mixed up and you, you get 1939, you get Gone with the Wind, you get Weathering Heights, you get Wizard of Oz. It's kind of a mature art form by then. It's basically Wagnerian light motive uh, with Italian, arioso kind of melody singing. So it's light mode is in that there's a theme for a character and the themes are Italianate and then they're kind of song-like. Um, uh, they have song structures kind of, you know, four bars, eight bars or, or whatever. Or it's a, like Jaws, like a, a two note motive or something, you know. Right. Um, and that is what it became. But I wouldn't say that's what it is now. I think it's mm. fundamentally different now. Interesting. Film technology has changed so much and, but mo most of all, the means of distribution have changed. So with social media, short form stuff, um, you, you ha I think look at it all, you know, look at TikTok, look at YouTube, look at all that, that affects what movies are. Mm. And I think movies, the way they historically have been, I don't think they will cease to exist by any means, but I think it's a different business now. Mm. And 
you know, money, like how much a film made over this weekend and how much this made and this made this much money and in these, you know, this obsession with how much money it made. Okay, yeah. But when you compare it to the money that Apple and Google and our world now, where you're talking hundreds of billions and a one or two trillion dollar companies, the whole film business is six or seven billion dollars. It's like nothing, you know. That, I think that's what's affected a change. And I think film music has gone a little bit down on the scale of what it used to do to tell the story. I don't think it's really thematic right now. Okay. It's more, I wouldn't say it's sound effects because it, it is thematic. It's just not thematic in the same way. I, see. I mean, yeah. I, I, that's a fairly nuanced statement and it's my opinion i i you know of course there still are movies that have themes and stuff but really up to a certain point as you said it was you could really follow it that it was this this yeah in the 60s it became mancini and alex north and you know goldsmith did you know uh, uh planet of the apes and you know and and john did a bunch of very modern ish scores and then you know and then you get Jaws, which is a complete change, disruption, and Star Wars, which yeah. now yeah. everything is, you know, Star Wars. And and we are sort of still in the Star Wars universe with Marvel and stuff. Yeah, so I yeah. wonder, because you mentioned technology, because, uh, yeah, there's all these streaming platforms yeah. and all this stuff, and the amount of content that's required nowadays, it's immense. Yeah. And so the timelines for composers, and you know yeah. this, have shrunk. Yeah. And to create... Um, I mean, how has that affected the quality, uh, the type of scores that we write? I, I just think there's so much more, so yeah. it goes so much faster. There's less money yeah. being bandied around. Um, it just affects the quality. It just does. It's the it's the it's the nature of it. You know, too much money is a bad thing too. You know, when you have unlimited money, you get, you know excesses and screwy things too but too little money is that's the normal thing mm -hmm. too little time too little money too little understanding of what music is there for um those guys really thought about in the 30s 40s 50s 60s john's generation goldsmith john williams goldsmith they really thought about what music is doing there yeah i mean if you yeah, think yeah. about it unless music is constantly through the movie from beginning to end where you start and stop is like a monumental decision. Mm -hmm. When there's no music in a in a film or television or even a YouTube, you know, there's no music, and then all of a sudden there's music, it doesn't even matter in a certain sense what the music is. Just the fact that there is music there. And then when it ends, the fact that it ends, it's making a statement. Statement, statement. So what I find now is they don't, they want you to try to hide it's making a statement. What what the 30s generation would call um, a commentative music. Music that is commentating in real time on what's going on in the screen or setting something up for later or all the things that we would think of as that style of, of film composing. That is not what people are asking for now. Mm -hmm. They want to not, they think it's giving away the story to comment, for the music to comment on it. So. It's more like, I would say, and again, this is my opinion, it's more like diegetic stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. is there something in the picture that um, makes this okay to have this music here or something? You know, um, Not that they didn't do a lot of that in the 30s and 40s too, because they had these huge research departments and there are lots of films that are basically source music based or song based. You know, Think of like um, Casablanca is all based on a song, all of it. I mean, almost the entire score is based on a song. It's like a theme and variations of a of a of a song. So it, it, they weren't opposed to doing that. Or like my father's film scored a, "How Green Was My Valley," which probably a lot of your viewers won't know, but it was a very famous like for, late forty or late forty. So it's based on a on a on a Celtic folk song or a Scottish folk tune. And they did they researched you know yeah you know, this and then mm -hmm. there's a lot of source music in it that is uh, it, it put together with scoring and stuff. Yeah. But I think now, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I would say that, well, <clears throat> on a positive note, I think that there have been, I mean, although rare, there's been some good scores that come out. Yeah, when, no, when you're no. working with, 
a director that can trust yeah. you or, or a director that's being trusted <laughs> to, to yeah. let the composer uh, do what they want. Uh, I've seen, you know, obviously Silvestri still gets to put yeah, out a good yeah, score once yeah. in a while. Uh, I mean, and there's, and John Powell. And, yeah, and no. some of these guys are really doing great work, but it's rare. And it, it's unfortunate because, you know, yeah. if we let composers do what they really can do, yeah. I think we do. It's, it doesn't happen instantly, this stuff. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like, of course, there's still going to be movies and theaters and every, yeah. you know, but it's inevitable. You can see where it's going and you can see that the film industry itself is kind of not really even facing the issue. If you look at the, what the Academy is doing and wh when people talk about film and theaters, it, it, you, know, you don't really get a good understanding of that they really understand what's going on, you know, and, and try to, you know, figure out what they can do to, you know, to yeah. figure out how to make this happen, you know. But it's like, it's also, there's other areas of media that are just exploding yeah. beyond film. Yeah. That a lot of they us, short, you know, short form, yeah. yeah, that are that are making a living, getting to write these big symphonic scores with themes, like in the video game industry, yeah. Yeah. really is lending itself towards this kind of yes. composing. Yeah. And uh, I do a lot of stuff for like the Disney parks and, yeah. you know, we yeah. can actually write a theme yeah. and stuff like well, that. Well, they so, want you to because then it, yeah. then it makes sense. What I'm saying is with what you see in film, feature films, yeah. and what you hear of composers and directors, I don't want it to I don't want you to do anything. I don't want this is yeah. too much. You're you're commenting it's be safe. too much. It is, it, it, but it makes sense. Yeah. There's... And maybe the the movies can't handle it. It's probably you don't know till you actually write it and look at it if the movie can even handle anything commentative at all. You yeah. know, yeah. where you're have a theme and it comes back and you recognize it from before, which is the essence of the Wagnerian light motive, uh, you know, which is 1850. I mean, that, that, that's back to, uh, you know, that, that period of time. I mean, well, Wagner's really the, the, the grandfather of film, film music, even though it's generally not Germanic. It, as I said, it's, it's more tuneful and, and a little bit easier uh, to comprehend, but still, the idea of a theme for a thing, a character, or a feeling is that's completely Wagnerian. Let's talk about your dad, okay. Alfred Newman. Yeah, uh, he uh, probably was the, the modern inventor of film music yeah. that we that we know of. And uh, yeah. so, so yeah, talk can, about. Can that. I tell you a little story? I conduct at the Bowl every year. John Williams is so gracious; he lets me split a program with him every year around Labor Day, and they're they're like rock concerts at the i don't know if you've ever the been hollywood to, bowl yeah, yeah they're yeah, the best yeah yeah I've been i mean out. they're like rock they're great yeah. they're crazy right we, the, we all went the whole okay. cine samples okay. crew was there okay. we we're cheering you on oh so you heard my story uh it's tell it again well my dad and gershwin were all were born gershwin was born in 1899 my dad was born in 1900 they both lived in new york you know my dad was born in new york he's the only great father of film music what they call it that that was born in America, but just barely, you know, <laughs> like twenty years uh, from Russian Jewish uh, parents, and he was a child prodigy, and he they were dirt poor. There were ten of them that lived in a one bedroom, one bathroom apartment in New Haven, Connecticut, where a bunch of Russian Jewish immigrants lived. But he was a prodigy. His mother recognized it, got him lessons, and he was making a living by the time he was 12, 13 years old, doing vaudeville and everything. So he met Gershwin when he was probably 14 or 15, because Gershwin was a song plugger at a publishing house on Tin Pan Alley, which was 28th Street in New York, between um, 5th and 6th Avenue. And there were yeah, a ton of them, and they were, they were selling sheet music. Sheet music was the only way to play popular music. There was no recording, right? Mm -hmm. And so they met, and then and then they met again in 1920 when my um, dad took over for Max Steiner, who was music directing a show called Dear Mabel, which was just some friggin' show that Max Steiner got sick. It used a bunch of Gershwin songs, and my dad took over, and then him and Gershwin became friends. And the stage manager was George Cukor. Of it. So George Cukor, Max Steiner, Alfred Newman, and Gershwin are all doing, and they're all 20 years old, and they're in New York. It must have been awesome, yeah. by the way. And, they're, and they have no idea what's coming. And in 1930, not Gershwin, but all those three are in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, early 1930, right when talking films are becoming commercially viable. 
And Steiner and Alfred Newman, as I said, Waxman, later Korngold, they invented film music. Mm. You can read, if you are so inclined and can find it, them discussing this. What do we do? Do we have music at the beginning, at the end, just in between scenes? It wasn't evident what to do. And the director said, why is there, why should we have any music here? We don't have any, it, it was more like they wanted to do like, what 19th century melodrama would have been, where a play and you have a scene change, you have some music. Right, right. No music during the scene because it's a play, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we do that. Or maybe we're like silent film. We just babble on with music through the whole thing, but don't do anything, you know, right. just, just do. And then they talked about trying to educate, they said, or talk these directors into letting them write some more original music because they were still like interpolating things. And like, there's a story of Steiner with King Kong, they, uh, 1933, um, uh, where um, he's, they test the movie and people are laughing at the stupid special effects and Steiner begs George, uh, King Vidor, who was the director, please let me write an original score. I'll scare the pants out of it. And he does, he writes an original score and it completely changes. It becomes a big hit, which is the, genesis of everything in Hollywood if it makes money, right, right? right? And people like it. And there were all kinds of things, Alfred Newman doing things, you know, and, and they eventually figured it out. And my father was at UA, United Artists, which is basically Goldwyn, which is over on Formosa and Santa Monica Boulevard. It was that studio. That had the best yeah. scoring stage of all hmm. in, uh, in uh, Hollywood. It was the first to go, but it was the best. That's where Best Years of Our Lives was recorded. Oh, wow. I don't know if you know that recording. Oh, yeah. um, so he stayed there till 39, then 39. He wrote the logo for um, Daryl Zanuck, I think 1933 or 34, but he wasn't under contract yet to Fox. The 20th century yeah, Fox the 20th century. So, but Yeah, but, it, yeah, but he, the, the first part of it, the, right. yeah. not the, with the extension. The first part, that was the end. Right. So any fanfare up till 1954, that's the fanfare. It's like nine seconds. It doesn't have the da 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 da. da, da. That was later, which we can talk okay. about if you want. So 1939, Daryl Zanuck hires him, and then he's at Fox for 20 years on that gorgeous scoring stage, which they totally figured out where to place mics. And they, my dad was obsessed with microphone placement. Mm. It was really the only, it, you placing microphones is how you mixed music. Mm. And his idea, because of his training is like when you sit in a great hall, you sit in Carnegie Hall or or the the the, the Philharmonie in Berlin or the concert house in Vienna, you know, you sit in the 10th row, it's just perfect. Mm. You hear the sound stage, you hear where everybody is, but it's all blended. You don't hear any individual violin playing, you know, unless it's a solo or something. So it's all about the blend that's very hard to get in a studio. So you would get it by where you place microphones in a particular room hmm. and you experiment, you know. Um, I, I think okay. I told you this story about MGM. If you go and, you know those rafters at MGM, you can climb up those Yeah, I've been ladder. up there. Have you been up there? <laughs> yeah. There are marks for how the West was won, which was in 1963, because he had a whole session just for microphone placement. Because he was freaked about it because he had been freelance for a few years. He had done everything at Fox. They had all the microphones exactly where they wanted. If they needed to do, say, some more big band stuff, they'd move the microphones. You know, that's how they mixed. It was okay. literally, wow. all right. literally hanging microphones. It, um, uh, I, I hope you can get your hands on some of the pictures because you can see the mics, how they did it. I don't think they used a tree. Maybe they did. Maybe they... I think they use single mics like way back against the back wall. Um, I'm sure there's people you can ask about it. It's completely fascinating to me because the mic placement, when I was playing a lot, um, I tried to sneak in and hear what I could hear and different engineers would place the microphones in different places. And really to get the sound of a symphony orchestra like that, like as if you're sitting in a hall, it's very hard to do. And, and you have to have the ear that that's what you want. And maybe you don't want to do that, you know, so. So was this the first time then that they were figuring out how to record an orchestra? Well, they were figuring it out. In a, in a 
studio. Like yeah, that. well, they were figuring it out in the 30s, but the technology initially was so bad. You mm. know, that's why there's a lot of tuba in a in a in a in a and the trumpets don't sound very good in early films. You know, mm. but the technology developed so quickly that, as I said, you get you get from 1930 to 1939. You listen to Gone with the Wind, and it all sounds like film. I mean, yeah, it's not. Yeah. the greatest but it it sounds like a film score right but right. in the if you listen to films 31 32 which are completely fascinating i highly recommend you your guy your viewers and everything just check out like my father did a 1931 king vider movie called street scene based it was a new york broadway play um very little music but there's enough a, a music in it and just see how it's used and you think why isn't there any music here why is, you know wouldn't mm. you know but if you take the ride from beginning to end, you can see what they were up against, what they were trying to figure out how to, how to do it. Mm. But by the late 30s, by the time he got to Fox, um, in their own ways, each, you know, him, Steiner, Franz Waxman, Korngold was at Warner Brothers. Oh, yeah, so Steiner that's... was at Warner Brothers. You know, um, uh, who am I? Mean? Chomkin, mm. Dmitry Chomkin, the Russian. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe he was at Paramount. I don't know. But they... All these had studio orchestras, full-time orchestras. Basically, it would be like, you know, Haydn or that era. They have an orchestra at their disposal 24-7. They have to pay them a certain number of hours a week, whether they use them or not. So they're just, they're just on call. They're all so happy to be there, the musicians, because they're getting way more money than they would playing in the L.A. Phil or Philadelphia. So you've got great musicians. You've got all these musicians flooding in from Europe. Jewish, Jewish, Russian, Jewish, Viennese, Jewish, German, Jewish. They all have great instruments because it wasn't expensive to have um, great string instruments. You can't Im imagine what a difference that makes. Mm. Having mm. a beautiful violin, cello, viola, and a bow. It, it, violins, bows, cellos can go from sounding like horrible to being like God made it. So a Stradivarius violin or a Del Jesu, a Guarneri violin, you know, costs millions of dollars now. The, then it was, you know, 20,000. Yeah, it's something right, you could right. afford. Or yeah, a bow yeah. now, a tort bow, the, the French bows were, were the bows. They all had this stuff, you know, would now cost two, three, four hundred thousand dollars It would have cost two thousand dollars then so yeah um and these musicians they also had to learn how to perform in a studio that's a exactly so that they were taught because max steiner and alfred newman as i told you before they came from broadway that they 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 learn conducting in broad you know steiner did in vienna and then here you know there was a lot of um broad, like popular music and vienna is a big popular music city too it's not it's a crate you know it's a waltz city it's it, it's a very weird place it's a fun loving you know it's not brahms and beethoven just there's that too in in opera but there's a lot of pop music uh uh, uh that's in the dna mm. so Korngold comes that's why he just was naturally good at film composing he 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 was a he had an opera the uh the tota stop was an opera he did in the 20s when he was just a kid it's still in the repertoire i mean it, it, he was that famous and he came here, he wanted to go back, but he couldn't go back. Now, none of them could go back till after the war, till 45, and many of them didn't go back, you know. Okay. So. so I wanted to talk about, sure. so uh, Alfred yeah. uh, was running the music department yeah. at Fox. So what, like, what was that like? Okay. Who was working under him? How did that, okay. you know? 39 work? to 59. Yeah. 30 to 39, he's working at United Artists on the lot at uh, UA, uh -huh. which was, I said, on Foremost. I don't know what they, I think it's, I don't know what they call it now, but it's still there, the studio. Not just not the recording stage. And he's working principally for Samuel Goldwyn. So basically, he answers to no one but Samuel Goldwyn. He's given wow. a budget. He does whatever he wants. Somehow, he figured out to zero in on Sam Goldwyn politically, and then he could do whatever he wanted. Um, Daryl Zanuck was desperate to get my father to Fox from like 1933 on. That's why he didn't write the logo for Fox. He begged and begged and begged. And finally, um, uh, my dad acqu acquiesced in 1939. It was kind of a crossover year. And he worked there. The only person he reported to was Daryl Zanuck. Everything else was run almost as a, as a despotic dictator. Um, 
it is completely unique, I think, in 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 the in the in this kind of environment. Though you know, they all had a lot of power, obviously. But Alfred Newman and the Fox Music Department, um, you can talk to John, you know, all these guys. It just, it was another universe, you know. So who John some came of, out of a yeah, jury, right. you know. Bernard Herman was mm. working at Fox in the 40s before Hitchcock. You know, yeah. Bernard Herman was impossible to work with. My dad could care less hmm. what a jerk he was. As long as he delivered, as, as long as he was talented, and deliver. He just didn't care. And if you weren't, you were so gone. Wow. He was scary, my dad. I mean, he could, but he loved talented people as long as they delivered. But that's arrangers, composers, you know, orchestrators, arrangers, orchestrators, the library. That mm. library is still there, mm. basically. They, they still have this library. It didn't get thrown away like MGM or this ridiculous stuff of the you know yeah, disney yeah, yeah. has a good library but everything was under there under his basically his control and he was very good at delegating once he liked somebody and trusted them he would delegate authority but he taught those musicians how to do this how to play in this style of of what you would think of as golden age hollywood film music which i would call this hyper rubato style there's always been rubato. I, I, you, you hear about Mahler and the way Wagner conducted and Brahms conducted. That there were, rubato means slowing down, speeding. It's it, 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 it's it's really a, a term of like stolen time in Italian, but it it it's ebbing and flowing. And and it, it was he principally did it under dialogue, but it became a it, it became stylistic. Yeah. And um and it was just in its zenith in the late 40s and 50s on, on at Fox and the stage. And as I said, they they set up the mics for this. And when they would have like a solo, they'd have a soloist, they'd, they'd, they'd have a solo mic. And you could hear, it's more of a chamber music-y sound than it is a huge orchestra sound. The winds and the brass are a little more um, defined, punchy. They're a little less roomy. They're still roomy and it's still blended. So, for instance, the Fox Orchestra of the late 40s and 50s on these big films, they'd have triple wins, which, you know, three, 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 but they wouldn't do it like that. They'd go two flutes, two oboes, five clarinets, hmm. and two bassoons. And the idea was the clarinet family is the mellowest single reed, right? And it's the mellowest part of the woodwinds that have the entire range. He'd have maybe an E flat, two B flats, uh, B flat, uh, E flat contra, which is not generally used. It's a wood kind of uh, symphonic band instrument, and then the the contra, and he would use that to it, when he needed to blend winds as an ensemble to blend with the strings because they were all about blend. Mm. But on the stage, they had to deal with these microphones because there was really very little you could do mixing and EQing and stuff like that. You know, it was right. it, you, you had to really, get it right from the beginning. You had to get it interesting, right yeah. from the beginning. That's very interesting about yeah. the, the, the woodwind yeah. setup. Uh, well, you can see, does it, it makes sense, right? Because yeah, if yeah. you want winds to like, you want to feel them, but you don't want to really hear them, unless it's a solo, if it's an oboe, you know, like right. that. It's just a color. You write, yeah. yeah, you write the oboes in a certain range because in a certain range, they don't stick out. The clarinets can be like almost inaudible in any range it's part of the way you can play a clarinet bassoons you can't do that you know mm -hmm. you know he might blend bassoons with horns which bassoons blend very well with horns whatever but the idea was to blend when he wanted to blend that's what you would do you'd have a big choir of clarinets that would help blend the um yeah, yeah. The, the 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 wood ones and the brass were like a lot of them were in these big bands, like these Harry James, is it Harry James band was the ones that my dad used to use. You know, they did a lot of those films too. You know, uh, swing films and and um, big, you know, big brassy, you know, films and stuff too. So they had a certain style that they did with that too, which really was a big band with orchestra. Okay. He did the Newman system. The uh, he did the clicks and streamer system, 1933, 34. Oh. He developed the streamers and the flutters um, because um, uh, because most of them were doing it with a sweep hand clock. You put the timing and the score, and you'd watch a clock. 
But you know, here's your stand, here's the clock, here's the orchestra, and here's the movie. So my right. dad was a really good conductor. So he wanted it to be like he's in a pit, in an opera pit. And what in an opera pit, you're looking up. So now it's on the film, mm -hmm. all the sync stuff. Mm. So you're, you can look at your orchestra, which is really important. And you can look at the film, which is what you're performing to. Yeah. So he developed this thing of these streamers, these lines that go across and flutters so that you uh, on as a sort of buoy sink places. Yeah. And then the streamers are like, like, how do they make those? They scratch, they take a work print and sc mm. like a streamer, three foot streamer, five foot streamer or one and a half foot streamers, depending on how long you wanted it to take to go across. And then the flutters, they just punch a couple of holes in the film. And isn't that true? Like, and it's scientific. They you would know, they, like they, literally they, score the film. Yeah. Like that was where the term yeah. scoring came from. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And spotting the film. Uh, music goes here in this spot, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then it stops in this spot. And it the actual, in. yeah, yeah, the punch, actual frame, the, 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 yeah. the, the frame it's, right. itself, yeah. yeah that's fine. And then the, he developed also the the flutters, as I said, that were you could see um, it, it would go every other frame, maybe three or five or seven, whatever you wanted. You could sync it on the third frame, on the first frame. You know, it was all science. There was a book of how to do it, and the music editors did it. And the thing about flutters is you're conducting, and you don't have to be staring at the at the screen. You could be looking, say, at the cello, say, and and and. But peripherally, when when something flashes, your eyes can you see, see it. it. Yeah. You can see it. So, so they, yeah. and that's still used today. Yeah. That system is. I just did Home Alone at Hollywood uh, at uh, the Disney Hall. It's all streamered and flood. Well, it wasn't. It f it's fluttered a little bit, but it's all streamered, right? Just like right. Um, uh, that used to be. Now we put bar and beat counters on it, which they didn't do. And now, of course, you can have you could have a streamer every bar, which you could have do, but it was just too work intensive. Somebody had to scratch the uh, right. emulsion <laughs> off the film. Yeah. And click has always been used. That was an innovation from the beginning. Uh, Max Steiner did that. They all used Click mm, okay. um, from when they when they needed it, but Alfred Newman probably less than than most of them. Max Steiner always almost always used Clicks because he wasn't that great a conductor. I'll tell yeah. you, I'll tell you a story like I did uh, Casablanca. You know, you must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. So it's the the whole score is a variation of that. So where Alfred Newman would write. Da 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 do three four da da two three four and if it was a cue he'd go da dee da 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 yeah right. he'd conduct he would, yeah. but yeah. it would all be notated in four four it just block notation it wouldn't be noted Max Steiner the opposite ah. it's all triplets and like you know da da, da 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 yeah it's like it looks like a mess it's, okay. it's like, yeah. like you the musicians have to like what you know. You have to figure out because it would be click, 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 click. So he'd write the rubato in, ah. into the actual music itself. Mm. John Williams told me that because I, I was doing it at, at Tanglewood one year, the the last scene, and I thought, why is he doing this? And I thought, do you know why? And he said, well, he's just writing in the rubato. Yeah. My dad would conduct the rubato. Max Steiner would write in the rubato because he always used a click track. Wow. So yeah, they all had different yeah, styles. Yeah. Tompkin and my dad. It's all the same end was, result. It's just it's like the how, same, it's the yeah. same end result. Yeah. 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 One of the things I want to talk about is the room itself. Yeah. Which has been around since 1930. Yeah. When was it built? I, I don't know. Is yeah. it, it's it built in the 30s, right? Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's before. Yeah. You can get the that. Yeah. We'll look, yeah. we'll look that yeah. up. Uh, we'll, and we'll show the picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the history of the stage. Uh, you well. Know, you had a full-time orchestra there. Yeah. They were just what sounds incredible to me. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we were born in the wrong decade. Yeah. But um, so, what was that like, and what was the room like, technically speaking? Okay, as far as I know, the room was put back in '89 to exactly the dimensions as it was when it was built. However, the the, the so what was, okay, it was put back. What, when did they right, change? I'll give you the thing. So yeah. he goes in the fort. Right now, those of you that have been to Fox, you'll show pictures. There's a big, huge control room at the back of the at the back of the room. Right. right? That didn't used to be there. Okay. When my dad was there, that was the wall. That was the back side of the studio. Okay. So he's facing the the screen. And back of him, and so the up, screen location, sorry, the screen location is where is, it is now. This hasn't changed no, in a hundred no. years or whatever. Yeah, but the 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 recording booth was upstairs, um, 
to his to as he's standing looking at the screen it would be to his right yeah there were stairs okay. that you'd go up that's where the control room was and there was a Wurlitzer organ there too that was that yes. that was part of the thing yeah, that yeah. Nate Nate Barr I think bought right. somebody yeah, yeah yeah anyway so that's the way it was right through all the years of my dad and then when television started getting ramping up um where it all had to be live and they were doing sessions you know, morning, afternoon, and evening, you know, five, six days a week, you know, and Ly Lionel was there at that at that time. They decided because they needed, I, they, there weren't any ISO booths, or I don't think there were any ISO booths. What, what you know, they just didn't do it that way. Everybody right. was in the sure. room. Now they need ISO booths. You know, they need a drummer in an ISO booth. They don't want to, you know, it's impossible to record a drummer in the, you know, in a space with the orchestra if you want to really do it. And, you know, maybe a stand-up bass player or whatever. They, so they, they, they rejiggered it. They, they, I, I think they moved the, 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 um, they moved, they, they had the, um, uh, the control room. Now, I'm not sure of the exact history of this. Somehow the control room en ended up where it is now, though it wasn't near the size that yeah. it was. And, and they used a bunch of these ISO rooms. They still have ISO rooms now, mm -hmm. but they, they, they moved it back because and, and the, they moved it back to the original dimensions. So that went on for years. Lionel left TV kind of started dwindling and, it, and, it, and, and more feature films were now being done at Fox. And then the powers to be at uh, Fox, like they do at all the studios, some brilliant genius decided, well, we're not making any money from the scoring stage, which of course they don't really, you know, it's more of a, of a value added um, proposition. Mm. Of course, they don't care that it's historic and, you know, it should be a landmark and no one should be, ever fucking be able to touch, excuse my language, should be able to touch it. Yeah. Now let's get rid of it. Let's turn it into offices or, yeah. or, or a, a dubbing stage or whatever. And Robert Kraft, God bless him, mm. fought and fought and fought to restore it. Let's restore the stage. Let's have a big event. Let's, let's you know, and we're going to be one of the only stages. And um, so they did. They put it, that physical space to my knowledge, is put back almost exactly to where it was. Now the control wow. room is included and there is an ISO room on each side, as you as you know, that you can use. So it's great. It's best of both wow. both worlds. So the you stage know? is basically what it was dimensionally in the, the 1940s. The, yeah, I mean I don't know that it's the same wood, but it right. might 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 be. I don't I don't know. Um but the layout. But, but the yeah. wood that it's a wood floor and the layout, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now the organ's not there anymore, but um, and the control room's not up. It's where yeah. what, you know where it is now. Of course, it's a fantastic control room. I mean, it's God. You can have twenty people in there easily, and it's yeah. not an issue at all. It's great. I love the control room. There. Yeah, it's my favorite. Now a lot of composers. Now the way that uh, Alfred and a lot of the composers, yeah. they would have the orchestra positioned a certain direction. Is that right? He would be facing the, the screen. The screen. It's it's kind of uh, like it is now. It, it, it's okay. sort of like it is now. I think sometimes some people would experiment with going uh, sideways. They did that, I think, at MGM more. Um, uh, messed around with the room, but uh, like I said, my dad had it. They had a setup, and they just they just left it. You know, yeah. they they yeah. basically was just set up all the time. So at a moment's notice, you could get everybody in and record something. They used to record like all night. You know, and, and my father, they would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. You, you, you hear directors talk about this a lot. You know, some directors just don't want to do take after take after take. They think it gets, it gets everybody worse. Um, so they either rehearse, well, a lot of directors don't rehearse. They just, they just want, you know, to have this authentic thing. But the, the idea for my father was to rehearse, 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 rehearse. Get all the wrong no you know you know get all your ducks in order right one take one take uh, your first take is just going to be your they see the red lights on it's like playing a concert okay. that's what that was the idea in fact not, not that they didn't do things over and over they of course they did but that wasn't that wasn't what they were planning for hmm. but everything was just left you know and i think they probably would adjust it depending if it was a big band score you know what? There were there were like three kinds of scores. There was like the comedy, with the big band thing, you know, and then there was the noirish Bernard Herrmannish type of scores, and then and then the um, dialogue, um, you know, big big picture scores, you know, mm -hmm. and and 
they probably adjusted it depending on what it was. Also, the size of the orchestra. I think th there was only maybe 40 or 50 people on contract because um, a lot of the films they did were, you know, B and C films. I mean, they were just churning the stuff out, you know. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are lost to history. But um, I, I, when they did a big film, you know, they had their setup. Once they figured it out, that was, that was what they did. Yeah. So. so one of the things that we did there is, you know, we were trying to, when we sample, that's what we do, we sample and we're trying to preserve the history of these iconic stages. Um, as you know, we yeah. sampled the, yeah, the whole orchestra at the MGM yeah. stage and who knows if it'll be around, yeah. you know, five, yeah. 10 years in yeah. the future. And that, that's kind of one of the things we want to do with this stage yeah. is really capture this, yeah. the history and, and present it to you know, the, the uh, community, sort of yeah. maybe next generation of composers yeah. to keep that legacy yeah. somewhat intact yeah. a little bit. And um, so uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, using a sample library recorded at the Fox scoring stage? Well, I mean, it's what you guys have done. Have, I mean, I, it's you guys are our bread and butter. I mean, the, the, it's so inconceivable now how good your sample libraries are now. It, it, it's, it, you can get... I, I mean, I suppose if you're really, really good at it. I mean, the only negative is they sound so good and you get, wow, this is a great oboe solo and these notes are oh. great. I love these yeah. notes and they sound really good. So I keep, I, keep, um, I keep writing to those notes. But as it gets better and better and better, you find you can just, you can do everything. Right. Like I find a lot right. of the string articulations are sometimes hard to find you know the the, yes. the 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 legatos like this where the dee da dee da, da like like where it's articulated in two in a bow or three in a bow mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. hear the you know stuff like that but it gets better and better and better and and, and I, I can't i when i started i didn't do any of this i just banged on the piano and and you know just kept my fingers crossed you know you play some stuff for the director and you just keep your fingers crossed because you go to a session, of course, it doesn't sound yeah, anything right. like what, you know, what, what they do. I mean, on the one hand, there's a magic with that because it's not micromanaged. But really learning, and when you sit at a sequencer and take a sample library, you know, you generally you're only putting in one thing at a time. Okay, yeah, maybe you're putting in a whole string part at a time, but... You know, if it's an oboe, it's one at a time. I mean, it's kind of like how you compose. You know, you right. you do this, then you, hmm, should I do? You know, should I do this? Oh, okay, let's do that, and let's do that, and let's do. That. You're, yeah, yeah. you're going this way and this way. Right. You know, mm -hmm. bar one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then how am I coloring bar one? How am I coloring bar two? And you know, yeah, and it's like a it's like a miracle now. I can't even imagine going back to, you know, sitting there, you know, with a frigging pencil and an eraser. We used to have like piles of eraser in our piano. At mm. least I had to write on a piano. Um, and now it's just, you know, it's fantastic. So, and yeah, yeah. The, the, these studios are historical monuments. I think they should be preserved. I think it's great what you guys are doing. I hope they don't go away. I hope yeah. the younger generations get to work in them. They're, yeah. they're, there's something about walking into these places it gives you the chills, kind of. I mean, if you're if you're interested in this stuff at all, and you love movies, and you know, um, you know, you asked me about the young generation. I think the history of movies is something that most directors like to talk about, mm -hmm. but it's it's intrinsically interesting mm -hmm. how what they did, and and these stages go back to the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's awesome. I think. Yeah. So then, how did how did uh, your dad, uh, you know, he was an innovator Definitely. in his own right. They were all innovators because they started in 1930, and every year there was a huge innovation. And they had staffs that were technology experts, and they had the money. They had the money. So, so where else are you going to innovate except in this brand new medium? And remember, there was pre-talking films and talking films. I mean, can there be more of a disruption? Mm. I mean, the internet, I think, is a disruption that we lived through. Or maybe you didn't. I mean, you might be too young, but I remember when no, there I was remember. No, Okay, I remember when there was no internet. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there's internet and it's a disruption. But imagine there's no talking films. And then all of a sudden there are talking films and it's like, 
what is, you know, what is this? You know, what yeah. are we going to do with this? And, and it was the most exciting place to be, to be in Hollywood here. And the sound was the new thing. So they, they had complete carte blanche. All the technology companies were desperate to get their gear, microphones, uh, you know, film technology, editing technology, technology of projecting where, you mm. know, mag acetate, you know, all the things that they went through to get to, you know, where we're now, which is just yeah. everything's ones and zeros. Everything's digital. And like when you're, whenever you're innovating in technology, you do get some flack yeah. from, from the folks that maybe want to hold on to the old way. Yeah. Did, did, well, did he no, ever encounter no, anything? No, because they, it was so bad initially okay. that, <laughs> that, that it got to a certain point. Now, for us, of course, you know, when we went from analog to 16-bit, it was terrible. Mm. And, and early dig, dig stuff, digital stuff, was very, it, it, you really lost yeah. something. And remember when we went to 24-bit, oh, it's much better. And the sampling rate, 48K, and the, you know, and then eventually it just kind of disappeared. But then there's a whole generation growing up on Napster listening to crappy MP3s. It's mm -hmm. not how I, I grew up listening to the Beatles and Hendrix and classical music on LPs mm -hmm. on, you know, analog. And I think that's then, coming back, though. It is. LPZ. I mean, it, it, they, they, are, they are coming back. And eventually it'll all be, you know, Dig will get so good that you, you won't be able to tell, tell the, the difference. You know, I think, yeah. I think uh, you know, there was a lot of bad stuff with LPs, too, you know. But, my God, they used to make these acetates that just sounded awful, you know. And, and I don't think any of them longed for the old days until kind of our era. Mm. I, I think it was... You know, wow, we have a great new microphone. It sounds great on, you know, a saxophone or, you know, or we can direct right into the board or we, you know, and then as electronics came and yeah. and all that, I don't think anyone ever looked back on, you know, on fondly on, you know, the, the 30s or anything like that. Yeah. But we do now, for sure. Sorry about this sort of abrupt ending there. That's just kind of where the video ended. But thank you guys for listening. And I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And like me, walked away from it feeling like maybe you learned something? I don't know. And you know, if you haven't already and you're feeling inspired, go check out Musio. We've got over 1,700 premium virtual instruments in there, some of which were actually recorded at the Alfred Newman stage at Fox Studios. And the best part is you get Musio completely free for 30 days. So what do you have to lose? Just get in there, explore the instruments, get creative, and make something great. If you like this conversation and you want to hear more like it, be sure to like, rate, review, do all of those things, and subscribe to catch future episodes. And feel free to let us know what kind of stuff you'd like to hear too, you know, whether it's interviews like this, or tips and tricks, or even just us sort of talking about current music events. We're open to all of that. We really want to make content that inspires you, so reach out to us. We're really looking forward to sharing more with you all in the new year. But for now, signing off for 2023, I'm Chris Hazel, and this is Orchestrated, a music podcast. Happy New Year, and we'll catch you in 24.